any of you just love the baby stage? If you're a parent or a grandparent, or if you have a little one in your life, you know how awesome it is to hold a little one close, especially after they start sleeping through the night. <laughs> it can be hard to let go of those babies. We're hesitant to let them grow. I think we're like that at Christmas as believers, stuck in the baby stage. We park at the manger at Christmas. And I'm not being critical of those cherished days with babies. Don't get me wrong, and please don't pick up any stones. I've been there before. It's worth stopping to enjoy all the mystery and beauty of Jesus' birth. But there's so much more. When I think of the advent of Christ, I can't help but think about being set free, not by a baby, but by a man. My story was one of total darkness. You may have heard of it. To put it mildly, I wasn't treated well by men or spirits. In fact, I was filled with evil spirits, and no one could help me. No doctor, no priest, no prophet. My family had to put me in chains just to keep me from harming myself. You may not know this, but I came from a wealthy family. There was a time when we could afford to buy anything, but we could not afford to buy my freedom from that darkness. It was shameful for all of us. It was terrifying for everyone, but especially for me. Would I ever be myself again? What was happening to my body and to my soul? What did it say about my family? And then I met Jesus, and he set me free. One demon after another was out of my body, out of my soul, freed. My mind was freed. My future was suddenly wide open. And I could now serve Jesus and walk in his ways, walk physically beside the Messiah, follow him from glory to glory. Christmas for me is a reminder that Jesus came to set all women and all men free from their darkest darkness, released from their greatest fear into a hope that is indescribable, not only in this life, but also to a life everlasting. Hey, come stand here. Okay. Today I light the candle of hope, for all our hopes are realized. When Jesus sets us free, may you know the hope of Christ this Advent season and every season of your life. Get this going. Amen. Part today with a statement. I'm going to be a little bit different how we go out. When God's will is made clear in life and we obey, nothing is impossible. When God's will is made clear in life and we obey, nothing is impossible. When we obey, nothing is impossible. When I was getting prepared and getting ready for today and thinking about Mary in the impossible. And I kept thinking of that word impossible. And there, as you know, I like to watch movies and I love motivational ones. And I know the one I'm going to be referring to, I've referred to before. But the scene I'm thinking about today, it's a, it's a football movie. Um, but the coach is telling this young, you know, this young team, they're finally to the, to the championship. A team of 35 players is playing the top team in the state, has won it three times already, or two times, and there's 85 of them, and there's 35 from Shiloh, and there's 85 of this other team, and they're, of the Giants, and they're getting there to this final game, and of course, you know how it's going. It's clear down to the wire, and it's all up to a 127-pound field goal kicker. He's got to kick a 51-yard field goal. Odds aren't good, because he's never done it before. <laughs> and, and it's just, you know how this goes. But it's so great because one of the things that they're doing is that that coach 
has been all season, they have decided as a team to put God first in everything. There's been a revival at the school. There's been young men coming to know Christ. And so it, he says, we're laying it all on the field today. And then he tells this young man to kick the ball. And what do you suppose happened? He made it, yes. They won the game by one point. And that team of 35 students came, took down the team of 85 students. Great big guys, too. And it was just amazing. But I want to show the clip and how that worked in the locker room and, and what he was talking about with these guys. Because these words, what the coach kept saying, is anything impossible for God? Okay. Okay. I got something to say. David Childers. Don't you ever let anyone tell you that you're under par, second rate, or inferior. I just watched God do a miracle through you. I saw a field of giants, 85 of them to be exact, fall in defeat. Now you tell me what's impossible with God. Nothing, coach. Zach, I just watched you and the offense do what they said could not be done. Now you tell me what's impossible with God. Nothing, coach. Bro, how about it? Built that stone wall, didn't you? And it stood. Now you tell me what's impossible with God. Nothing, coach. How about it, Scott? What's impossible with God? Nothing. Are you sure? Because those giants are big. They got numbers three to one. Are you sure there's nothing impossible with God? I'm sure, coach. How about it, Nathan? What's impossible with God? Nothing, coach. Jonathan? Nothing. Are you positive? Positive, coach. So am I. So am I. God can do whatever he wants to do, however he wants to do it. And he chooses to work in our lives because he loves us, because he's good. Hope today is a milestone for what he can do for the rest of your life if you trust him. And we spend some time thanking him. So the coach asks his players, is there anything impossible for God? Like I said, that phrase has been going through my head all week long. Is there anything impossible for God? So I did a word search in the Bible about in the, with the word impossible, and I, there was a few verses that mentioned that. Job 42, 1 and 2. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no plan is impossible for you. Jesus said to his disciples in Luke, with people, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And in Luke 1, 37, an angel named Gabriel is speaking to a young woman, and he says, for nothing is impossible with God. Now, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but that word impossible <clears throat> can often be thought of as a miracle, a supernatural act of God that takes place. <coughs> Excuse me. And often that's where we're starting to think about, I think, think, you know, what are the miracles that have happened in our lives around us? And a, a miracle or something that is supernatural is something that we can't do our, by ourselves. It's something that we are unable to do without some supernatural presence. And there's a lot of those kind of instances, especially in the Bible, and there's a lot of them in our lives as well, which we're going to get to. But today's character of Christmas a young woman, possibly as young as 13 to 17 years old, I mean a teenager, is who we're going to be talking about. Her name is Mary. And she had the impossible task of first believing an angel that told her she was going to be pregnant with the Son of God and trusting that God was using her in that way. And so I want to I'm going to take it today out of the English Standard Version for a number of you know, just because I liked how they placed it the best. It will be up on the screen for us, and it is in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38 that we'll be taking the scriptures today. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, 
Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord, and let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now, last week we read about eight Gabriel going to visit Zechariah and giving him an impossible message, telling Zechariah that you and Elizabeth will be having a son in your old age, and your wife has been barren, and now the impossible is going to happen. And, you know, they haven't heard from God in this time period for about 400 years, since the time of Malachi to, this, to the written word of Matthew. There has been nothing, not a lot, you know, there hasn't been anything written and shared about God. And God hasn't had a message for the people of Israel in quite some time. Yet here is Gabriel, twice in, in less than a year, delivering some messages from God. And first, his message was to Zechariah. And now the message is to a young woman named Mary. She is in the town of Nazareth. She isn't from a, Nazareth is not a priestly city. It is not a rich area. It is a poor, poor, poor city. And here she is doing, going about her stuff. And she gets a message. Don't think I don't see you, little one. I think there's enough for both of us, though. Fear not, for you have been favored by God to conceive and bear a son. A... Uh, a son? But how? The Holy Spirit will overshadow you, and the child will be called the Son of God. For nothing is impossible with God. Thank you. Do I say thank you? I mean, yes. Let it be done just as you say. Surprise would be an understatement, right? I mean, you're having an angel come and visit you, and, and you're a teenage girl. You're just going about your stuff, and, and here she's hearing from Gabriel. You know, she, he told her what was going on, that the message, the messenger, the Messiah is being prepared to come to his people. First, John the Baptist is going to be coming to Zechariah and Elizabeth, and now the Son of God is going to come through Mary. Like most people, she would have assumed that the leader of the people of Israel would probably come from a priestly line, a kingly line. She, she wouldn't have been expecting it to be somebody like her. I mean, she might not even had a lot of scripture teaching because she was female. They didn't do a lot with, they didn't do a lot of education with young ladies at that time period. But I, am, I assume she went to the synagogue. She went to the went to the temple with her family and heard the messages from the rabbis, the Old Testament, over the years. So she knew that there was a Messiah coming. That was part of their history. They all knew, the people of Israel knew that one day the Messiah would come. But as most people would have assumed, he would be coming to be an earthly king. He would be coming to be a ruler. He would be coming out of a family that would be way more important than a young ladies in Nazareth. So she's got this message, and, and Gabriel is talking to her, and, and you think about her. I mean, this young woman, you know, she's just, 
hanging out with her friends. She's helping her mom with the chores. She isn't anybody special to us. But to God, she had found favor. The angel said, you have found favor with God. Remember, Zechariah and Elizabeth, we heard that they were righteous people, and they pleased God, and they lived according to his, his will, and they were following him faithfully. And God chose them to be the family of John the Baptist. And now we have Mary. And she is, whoops, she is found, with, found favor with God. So Gabriel delivered his message, and her heart and her spirit had confused, and quite likely, you know, pretty afraid at first. And Gabriel begins with greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Wouldn't that be awesome to be the first thing I tell you? The Lord is with you. God is with her. Those words bring peace and comfort and strength. She was greatly troubled at the saying. I mean, that's kind of a no-brainer. We all would have been pretty greatly troubled at hearing that you're going to be pregnant. And, you know, she's getting ready to get married. She's probably getting ready to get all the stuff for her new household. And here, now she's got, there's a big difference going to happen in her life. And the angel tells her, don't be afraid. And behold, you will conceive in your womb, and you will bear a son. And he will be called the Son of the Most High. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And she knows from what she's probably heard in the, in the, in the synagogues, in the temple, that this is the Messiah the Son of God, and, you know, why would she be chosen? And as if we go into the, um, Luke farther down in Luke, she sings a song very much like that. But it's an amazing greeting, and to find out that you are going to raise up the Son of God in and of itself is pretty scary. But then to be found pregnant as a virgin would be totally th terrifying at this time period. She was greatly troubled. How could this happen, she said. It wasn't like Zechariah kind of telling the, Gabriel that this can't happen. She says, how can this happen? What I really like about God is that he can take our questions. He's okay with questions. He knows we don't understand. In fact, he recognizes he knows our questions in our heart before we say them out loud. He just needs us to vocalize them. He needs us to recognize that we are indeed powerless, that we are indeed in need of him to explain things to us and help us out and to direct us and give us the strength we need. He doesn't mind our questions. We don't have all the answers. We wouldn't need God if we did. We don't have all the answers. But we can know we can always come to God and he will listen. The angel didn't condemn her for asking. She, he, she wasn't saying it couldn't happen, only she didn't understand how it would happen. I'm a virgin. How can I get, be pregnant? It just doesn't work like that. And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The Holy Spirit will overshadow you, and the power of the Most High will come and live inside you. He will plant his seed inside of your womb. And the baby that will be born will be the son of God. It was a simple question she asked, but the angel gave her the answer. When we come to God with our questions, he is faithful to listen and to answer. Psalm 34, 4 says, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. That was King David. Jeremiah 33, says, 33 verse 3 says, Call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. And Isaiah 1.18 says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. See, God isn't upset with your questions. He's okay with those because he already knows you have them. He just needs you to, it's okay to ask him out loud. You know, when something bad happens, it's okay to say, why? I don't get it, God. Why are you letting this happen to me? Why, why is this happening in our world? I mean, there's a lot of questions we have, especially in our culture right now and the way the world is going. Why does God allow all of this to happen? He's okay with us asking. And if we seek him, he says, I sought you, and he answered. God will answer us. 
I sought, God answered. Call to God, and he will answer. Reason together with God. We can reason together with God. He'll listen, and he'll answer. He is waiting for us to step out in faith and trust him. Because sometimes we're asking, and we really don't want to know the answer. We just hope he'll answer what we want to hear. So we have to step out in faith, being willing to take the answer he gives us and run with it, to be obedient to his calling. Mary came with that question, how can this be? But she was willing to step out in faith because then she said, let it be to me as you have said. Let everything you say come to happen. She was willing to be used, willing to do what God has asked. And then he told her, he, the angel said, your cousin Elizabeth is six months pregnant, and she was not supposed to ever have kids. She, she is six months pregnant. Now, Mary's mind, like all of us ladies, is going, you know, thinking, okay, that's a miracle, you know. And she's starting to put this all together. And, for, and then the angel says, for nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. Sometimes that's hard for us to digest, but God, God's going to cover you, Mary. God's going to give you a baby, and, and nothing is impossible. And think of all the miracles. I mean, if, we, if you've read through the Old Testament, there are a lot of impossible things that happen. So I'm going to ask you to help me write some of them down. What are some of the impossible things that you remember from, from Sunday school, from, the, from your reading of the scriptures? What are some impossible things that you know that have happened? Okay. Lazarus rose from the dead. That's a biggie. Lazarus. Somebody was told to say it, so. Parting of the Red Sea. Yep. What else? Noah's Ark. Manna. Yep, I healed a lot of sick people. Healing sick, blind. I think there's some lame in there. The fish. The fish. What about the fish? Well, feeding 5,000. Awesome we talked about that one last Sunday, actually. Water out of wine. Into water, into wine. Okay. The resurrection itself, Jesus' resurrection. Oh, I spelling. <laughs> Sorry, I really screwed that one up. Um, walking on the water. Yep, talk to Moses from a burning bush. Yep, Jonah. Yep, it's a pillar of salt. Those are, you guys are doing great. Goliath. Taken down. Yep, destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. What did you say, Jenny? Oh, yeah. All right, calming the storms. Yeah, I can't write as fast as you guys are talking. Once you get going, pretty good. <laughs> huh? The temple, her curtain being torn down. Good. Okay. <laughs> okay. There we go. I can do that. Um, okay. I, I think we got it. <laughs> there's a lot in there, isn't there? In fact, there's a number of resurrections. Elisha raised somebody from the dead. Peter raised somebody from the dead. Paul raised somebody from the dead. It happened. There's been a lot of miracles. All of those things are supernatural acts of God, right? They could not happen without God. And we think, you know, we think a lot of times, well, those only happened in the Bible. They aren't still happening today. Well, I found a few 
that were memorable and put in the news so we could have some pictures to share with. I mean, I know there's some in my life and I know there's some in yours as well, but there's a couple that I wanted to share with you as well. First, there was a, in March 2015, Lynn Jennifer Grosbeck, 25, lost control of her car and ended, it ended up upside down in the Spanish River in Utah. In her car was her 18-month-old little girl. Somehow, that little girl got, was thrown from the car, hanging upside down over the river, and they found her 14 hours after the accident alive. The mother died on impact. But what was also what helped them to find her was that, according to the police and the searchers and the firefighters that were looking for her, they heard a woman's voice tell them where to go. It said, help me. And they, there was nobody around. They, they said the mother had died on impact. But they all attest to hearing a voice telling them where that little girl was. And they heard that adult voice from inside the car. It said they can't explain it. And they can't explain how a little girl that age would have survived anyway. But God spared her and, and took care of her. Another young man, little, very little, not really, not a young man, 22-month-old little boy named Gardell Martin. He was playing with his siblings outside his parents' home in Miffenburg, Pennsylvania in March 2015 when he fell into the creek, 34 degrees water, because it's March, and he was found a quarter mile downstream by a neighbor. He was gone. It was, they, EMTs came and they worked on him for 110 101 minutes as they performed CPR all the way from the ambulance to the, hosp to, the, to the helicopter to the hospital. And that took him a few days. His body temperature was only 77 degrees when they got to the, to the hospital. And they warmed him up slowly over 24 hours. And when he woke up, there was no, sign of, no signs of neuro brain damage, <laughs> neurological problems. He was spared, whether it was miraculous because of the medication of the doctors, but even the doctors said there was no way they could have done that without, all by themselves. There had to be God's hand in it. Lastly, is a young man that was in a demolition derby in Rockersville, Virginia in June of 2014, and the accident left, he, his car got totaled during the demo derby, and he got threw out of his car. And here, his lungs were crushed, and nearly every bone in his body was broken. His brain had also suffered multiple strokes and hemorrhages, and his kidneys were failing. All that was happening, and, and they figured if he ever would wake up, because he was in a coma by the time he got to the hospital, if he would ever wake up, he would have been like a vegetable. But his family refused to give up, and they turned to prayer, and they told all of their community, all the churches, across, it went across the United States, across the world probably. And people were praying and praying and praying. And 10 days after the accident, Kirby opened his eyes, and he looked at his dad, and he said, I love you, Dad. And the doctors can't, couldn't believe it, and neither could Kirby. He says, I'm humble, I'm grateful, I'm just amazed. I know that God saved me. I know that it was God's prayer in believing that saved me. There are a few modern day miracles as well. That's what we're talking about. God does do the impossible. When we look at Mary's life, we see a young woman that accepted the announcement of Gabriel despite how impossible it looked to her, and she walked the path of obedience. If we want to see God do impossible things in our lives, we have to believe him and we have to be obedient to what he calls us to do, his calling on us. When God's will is made clear in life and we obey, nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. Most of us won't have an angel tell us what God's will is. Some of us would like, that would be nice sometime that God would come along and say, this is what I want you to do for your life, and this is how I want you to get there. And they would, he would just mark it all out. Wouldn't that be nice? You know, sometimes we pray about that. I know a lot of young people say, oh, I don't really know what God wants me to do. Or I remember me thinking, I'm, I knew what I was going to do, but it wasn't how it worked out. 
because God had another plan. And I had to get on the same, same, same wavelength that he was on, and it took a while. But when we look at that, you know, I've noticed that as I matured in my faith and I've walked in obedience with God, it's a great adventure. It isn't like I'm wondering every day. It means that every day, if I'm doing what I know I'm supposed to be doing, God is leading, and I can trust him. You know, there's going to be wrenches thrown in. Satan's going to attack everything we do and try to take us down, no matter what plan God has for us. So, but we need to stay focused on God. His will is revealed to us through others in our lives, through circumstances, through a number of things. And I want to share with you eight ways to discover God's will for your life. One, you need to walk with God if you want his will in your life. If you're interested in knowing God's will, develop a deep relationship with him. And it starts with reading this, reading God's word every day. You can't know his will if you don't open this book because he can't talk to you unless you're close to him. You need a relationship with him. It's not just a Sunday morning, but you need to be in church as well. You need to be in a life group. You need to be in a place where you're growing, where you're with other believers, iron sharpens iron, where you're learning God's word together so that you can apply it to your life. It's a relationship. It isn't religion. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's listening to him when he, we pray. It isn't just telling him what we want to do. It's listening to him and hearing what he wants from us. When we seek his disciplines in our life, God will begin to show us his first steps to take. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make direct your path. He will make your path straight. Secondly, surrender your will to God's. We all have a free will. We all have a choice. Am I going to follow God or am I going to go my way? And we do it daily sometimes. Sometimes we do it hourly. We have to decide. Instead of seeking God and saying, okay, God, here's what I'm planning to do with my life. Say, God, I give you all of my life. Show me. Walk me through it every day. You know, it's doubtful that God is going to give, show you his plan for your life if you've already got it all figured out over here. If, he, if you say, well, I'm going to do this, why would God bother to show you? because you're going to do what you want to do anyway. So God doesn't, you know, if we're not teachable, he isn't going to fight us. He wants us to choose his will, surrender ourselves to him. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Lay it down. Lay your will down to him. Holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. We have to lay our lives down. We have to lay it down as a living sacrifice. Number three, obey what you already know to be God's will. Obey what you already knew. Many people say they want to know what God's plan is for their lives, but they overlook the fact that 98% of it is already written down. We know it's God's will that we avoid sexual immorality. We know it's God's will to go to be a part of a church. We know it's God's will not to swear. We know many of us know the Ten Commandments. We're brought up and know those, right? That's, we know those things. Well, if we're not willing to follow those things, he's not going to give us more. He wants us to be obedient in what we already know. You have to obey what you already know before he's going to show you the next step. I know when I used to read, um, listen to Elizabeth Elliot and, and read some of her stuff, that's what she said a lot. When you don't know what to do, do the next thing you know you're supposed to do. And I think she was saying that after the death of her husband, Jim Elliott, when he died as a missionary down in Colombia, or Ecuador, down, down South America. And um, that really helped me a lot as a young Christian, just to know to do the next thing. Because I was a single mom, so the next thing I had to do was get up, take care of my daughter, do the next thing. I didn't always know what that was going to look like down the road. All I knew is do the next thing. 
and God would show me the next step as I was faithful to follow him. And that's what he does. Sometimes it is just one step at a time. You know, we talk about one day at a time. Like I said, one time, sometimes it's just an hour at a time. We need to keep our focus on him. Is there a sin in your life you're hanging on to? Take care of it. Is there a relationship that needs to be taken care of or that's getting in the way of your relationship with Jesus Christ? Take care of it. There's things that get in the way. Sin gets in the way of our relationship with God. God has shown us clearly what is his will through his word. Obedience is an important first step into finding out God's will for our lives. Four, we need to seek godly input. One key component to finding God's will is to speak to other Christians, people that you trust, and ask them their input as well. And I highly recommend that you seek out a, you know, a strong Christian. If you don't have people like that in your life already, seek out people like that. You know, if you're in a life group, that's a great place to do just that. Have some people around you that help you to challenge you. That helped me a lot when I started in my Christian walk. The pastor's wife that was here at South Troy basically took me under her wing, taught me how to be a Christian mother, taught me what, a, what made up a godly man <laughs> so that I didn't screw up again. And, you know, just to have people like that in your lives that come alongside of you and encourage you, and that's how I ended up teaching a Sunday school class because somebody said I was good with kids. And there I was. Then they hand me a book. <laughs> there I was. But that's how we do it is when people come alongside us. That's what your forever family is for, your church family. That's what your forever family is for, to help you. It says in Proverbs eleven fourteen, where there is no counsel, the people fail. But in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. The more you involve yourself in your community of believers, the more you will continue to know yourself and know the direction that God wants you to go. Five, pay attention to how God has wired you. You know, if I am not built to be a woman's basketball player, right? I played basketball on my, on my daughter's team at Schaefer. We did parents' night, and they were throwing the balls over my head. Because, I, I mean, there were men playing. It was co-ed on the parent side. And so these men are six foot five. And the girls' team was, too, because they're all taller than me. And I thought, you know, I could, once I got the ball, I was okay. But <laughs> it was, I'm not built to be a woman's basketball player. Obviously, that isn't something I'm going to do in my life. But if there's a specific role that God has created you for, there's going to be signs that you already have some of that gifting. And he's going to continue to help you with that and to develop those gifts in your life. 1 Peter 4.10 says, As each one of us has received a gift, minister to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Use the gifts you have, all, that you already have, for God's glory. If God has gifted you with the gift of kindness or the gift of hospitality, use those. If God has gifted you with the gift of generosity or the gift of speaking or singing, whatever that gift is, use it. And God will continue to develop it into the direction he wants you to go. Number six is listen to God's spirit. Listen to God. Listen to his Holy Spirit. He will touch your heart. I've experienced a major turning point in my own prayer life when I learned to shut up. And you know what? We had a speaker that confirmed that on Tuesday. Our, um, district, our district superintendent, Wes Smith, was, he had learned that too as well, and he said, the, the title of our, our talk was Shut Up. And I thought, wow, okay. <laughs> but it was so we shut up and listen to God. We need to be more quiet when we pray. We need to talk to God, but we need to listen for the answers. Take time to be quiet. And it's hard. It's hard to learn to be quiet and listen. But we need to start doing that. Jesus said in John 10, 27, My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. He is the good shepherd, and he says, my sheep, hear me. Let, at seven is listen to, listen to your heart, because when you're in tune with God, your heart won't deceive you. It'll be listening to God's heart. Um, Psalm 37, four and five says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will bring it to pass. When we, uh, when we put God first, when we find ourselves delighting in him, 
we will naturally want his will for our lives. Those two spirits won't, won't fight. Our heart spirit and the Holy Spirit will be, in, will be working together. And that we'll be filled with God's spirit and want to do what he says. I love that passage because it shows me that when I'm walking with the Lord, I actually don't need to worry about getting off track. I'm with him. So I don't need to worry about falling away. And I always have the most fun in my life when I'm doing God's will. That's why I enjoy what I'm doing. <laughs> I love being here. I love pastoring. I love being a part of the church. And that's when we, it's super exciting because every day is an adventure. I didn't say they're always easy. Sometimes there's huge challenges. Some days I'm on my knees in prayer all day because things don't always go as easily as I think they should. That's not, the thing is that God is leading and we need to desire what he wants us to do. And then take a look at your circumstances as the last one. God often clearly demonstrates in our plan by lining up circumstances that obvious, that sometimes we'll say they're coincidences, but they're not. God lines those things up for us. If it's not his will for you to take a job, it's, usually, it's not usually his will to, that you take a job that isn't offered to you. It isn't God's will for you to be pining after something that he's already closed the door on. It's not for us to try to discern God's will and then just ask his blessing. It's just, it's just to continue to go straight. Over the years, I decided, discovered that God is pretty good at opening and closing doors, and he did that here at South Troy. He did that in an amazing way here at South Troy. I mean, when you look at all the circumstances leading to us being a church here, we know it was the hand of God. When we came in 2010 and prayed those two, that month, we drove around, we prayed. We didn't know if God wanted us here or not. But then we saw and, and felt that God's leading here. And then between 2010 and 2012, we had to do a lot of, we had to raise funds to, to, change, to do a lot of physical work to the property that had been let go for about 10 years. And so that was a lot of work, and, and it was a lot of prayer, and it was a lot of money coming in from we didn't know where, but it came in, and it was a lot of support from the Austin church, but there was a lot of work done. And then, and then he continued to work, and I mean, a few years later, we're building an addition because everybody got together and wanted to, to, to continue to grow, and he's brought all of you here. I mean, we started with four. And we just, we knocked on over two, I think by now it's been close to 400 doors. We've knocked on a lot of doors in this neighborhood. But you know, it's all been worth it. But that's because we, God kept opening doors and, and helping people to walk through. God took a dead building, an empty shell, and resurrected a congregation here. Is anything impossible for God? That's pretty good. I'm going to do it again. Is anything impossible for God? No. no. God can do anything. Mary, a young virgin, becomes the mother of the Messiah. Is anything impossible for God? Nothing is impossible with God. When God's will is made clear in life and we obey, nothing is impossible. We are going to celebrate that today with communion. Because with Jesus, we talked about that impossibility, his resurrection from the dead. Jesus, that little boy that came to, Jesus, came to Mary, was born from a virgin, grew up to be a man at 33, and he had had a ministry for three years. He had, he had taught the disciples, and it had come to the time where, where it was time for him to be obedient to his father unto death and to go to the cross. And he did. He did that in obedience to his Father's will. That's why God brought him to us, to take our place. Because of his love, yes, but also in obedience to his Father. He did it because he wanted to save the whole world, each and every one of us, to give us the opportunity to come to him and receive him. In the Wesleyan Church, communion is open. Anybody that believes in Jesus Christ, it can take communion. 
So as our um, ushers come forward to, to take the elements, we ask that you hang on to the elements, the juice and the, and the wafer, and then we will all take communion together this morning. Dear Lord, thank you. Thank you that nothing is impossible for you. With, all, with you, all things are possible. And you can change lives and hearts. You can change us as we bring our hearts to you this morning in communion. Lord, I ask that you would transform lives, that you would heal those that are brokenhearted, that you would help those that have sin that are getting in the way, that they would bring those sins to you this morning and receive forgiveness. Lord, you have promised it. We call on you. We will always be saved, that you will listen and you will answer. Lord, you know our hearts this morning. You know where we're at. You know the things that we're struggling with. You know the victories and the joys that we're celebrating. Lord, we bring them to you because they're only from you. And Lord, we thank you for your healing. We thank you for listening. We thank you for bringing the ultimate gift to us by laying your life down in obedience so that we would have life with you forever. We thank you, Jesus Christ. In your name we pray.